If you're visiting with us tonight, what I intend to say deals with some views that make us different religiously. And I said last evening, and I want to repeat, that a, a mind like a parachute functions only when open. And I urge you to be open-minded about what I have to say. If I were to go to a Roman Catholic service, I would give the speaker my undivided attention. If I were to go to a Protestant service, I'd do the same thing. And I ask other people to do the same thing for me that I would be willing to do for them. And if what I have to say tonight is in harmony with the truth, then accept it. If it's not in harmony with the truth, then certainly I want you to reject it. Now, we have people in the church who don't like to hear doctrinal sermons on those tenets which make us different. But let me say, for the benefit of such, if they are present, that in my judgment, great doctrinal preaching has brought us to the point where we are now. And we have no right to exist as a religious fellowship unless we differ from others. And I am convinced that what I have to say tonight is one of those unique differences which causes us to have a right to exist as a separate and an independent fellowship. And again, if you're visiting, I urge you to weigh it in light of the truth. If it is right, then accept it. If it isn't, then of course you would be my friend by calling my attention to where I've missed it. Now, let me say this again. It's impossible for me to conduct a meeting in this community without using something that some have heard me preach on elsewhere. Well, there is one way I can avoid it, and that's by using six brand new sermons. And I wouldn't think about that in a revival. So if you have heard me discuss this elsewhere, then just get ready for a repeat. I'm not using it primarily for your benefit anyhow. But it is a sermon that I enjoy preaching. It deals with first principles. It's based on Acts 16:30 through 34. And I'll be working from those four verses. According to verse 30, the Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 31, they replied, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, those who have other religious beliefs are a bit surprised to hear a man of my concept quote Acts 16.31. And sometimes they will ask, Man, is that your doctrine? And my answer is yes. As a matter of fact, I've been preaching it for more than 30 years. You mean you tell people simply to believe on the Lord and they'll be saved? And again, my answer is yes. But I thought you believed that one needed to be baptized to be saved. I do. But that verse doesn't say anything about baptism. Are you really sure of that? If all of this talk were reduced to an argument, it would sound about like this. Whatever is not specified in a verse is not essential to salvation. Baptism is not specified in Acts 16.31, therefore it is not essential to salvation. But if that is a valid conclusion, look what else can be done with it. Whatever is not specified in a verse is not essential to salvation. Repentance is not specified in Acts 16.31, therefore it is not essential to salvation. Or try again, whatever is not specified in a verse is not essential to salvation. Loving God is not specified in Acts 16.31, therefore love of God is not essential to salvation. Now, if the first, two, two, uh, first conclusion is valid, the last two are also valid and for exactly the same reason. If the last two conclusions are invalid, then the first one is invalid and also for exactly the same reason. Several years ago, I pulled up to a gas station to get a tank of gasoline, and a fine man whom I've known across the years used Acts 16.31 on me. And he said, Jim, it's not a drop of water in the verse. And I replied, first of all, by calling his name, and I said, that verse doesn't say anything about repentance, and it doesn't say anything about loving God either. And if you're right in saying that baptism is not essential because it's not specifically mentioned in the verse, then repentance would not be essential and loving God would not be essential for the same reason. And then he said, why, Jim, all of us know you have to repent, and all of us know you have to love God. And I asked, why do we know that? Why do we know that? And I loved him then, and I love him now. But he didn't answer but I did. I said, I'll tell you why we know it. Because repentance is taught elsewhere in the Bible, and loving God is taught elsewhere in the Bible. And if repentance and love for God are both essential to salvation, although not specified in Acts 16.31, since they are taught elsewhere, 
Isn't there a strong possibility that baptism might be essential to salvation, although not specified in the verse, if it is taught elsewhere? I was in written discussion with a preacher in northeastern Arkansas, and he used Acts 16.31 on me to support his case. And I wrote back and said, Sir, why in the conversion of the jailer do you include repentance, which is not mentioned, and exclude baptism, which is mentioned? Baptism is mentioned in Acts 16.33. Repentance is never specified in the conversion of the jailer. But baptism is. So I asked, why do you include what is not stated and exclude what is stated? He didn't answer. But I think I can give you an answer. You remember that individual of ancient Greek mythology who caught people at night and threw them on his bed? And if they were too long for the bed, he lopped off their feet. And if they were too short for the bed, then he put them on the stretchers. Now, you and I know that he had the cart before the horse, or he had the engine before the Volkswagen. Now, what he should have done is made the bed to fit the people instead of making the people to fit the bed. Now, that man's misunderstanding of things sometimes happens when we study the Bible. The man to whom I referred a moment ago came to Acts 16, 30 to 34 with a preconception. The preconception was that repentance is essential to salvation. Baptism is not. Therefore, when he studied the conversion of the jailer, he included what is not stated, repentance, and he excluded what is stated, baptism. And he made the passage fit his preconception rather than making his preconception fit the passage. That can happen to any of us. I have great respect for Alexander Campbell for a number of reasons. One reason is the attitude he had toward the Bible. He said when he picked up the Word of God to read it, he tried to act as though he'd never read it before in his life. That's a beautiful attitude. He did his best to lay aside all of his notions and all of his preconceptions and to let the Word speak to him. Now, I wouldn't have a Bible I couldn't mark up. And teaching over here at school across the years, uh, I have marked up some Bibles and used them so much they've just fallen apart. But I tell you this, it's a good idea to read from an unmarked Bible as well. If you're not careful, you'll find out you're not doing anything except studying what you have marked. And when you read from an unmarked Bible, you'll see something that you haven't seen before. And when we come to the Word of the Lord, our attitude should be, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command, and I will obey. Now let's come back to Acts 16, 31. The jailer was told to believe on the Lord and he would be saved. That is the very bulwark of Protestantism. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. How many times have you heard an individual quote that verse and read no more? I've heard men do that while driving at night. I'd have the radio on. Someone quote Acts 16.31. And I'd want to say, hey, read a little more. Well, you don't yell that to a radio. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Or you hear a fellow use Acts 16.31 on TV and say, hey, read just a little bit more. This is the bulwark. This is the fortress of Protestantism. Acts 16.31. Do you know... If you leave the jailer at Acts 16.31, you will leave him in sin. He's still in sin. Well, how can you be sure of that? Because they gave him the commandment before they preached the gospel. He hadn't even heard the gospel. They told him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But according to Romans 10.17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's why after they told him to believe, they preached the gospel to him so he could believe. And if you leave him at verse 31, hear me, you will leave him in sin. You leave him not having heard the gospel. You leave him unregenerate. You leave him as an unbeliever. And yet that verse is cited, nothing more is read, and apparently a lot of fine folk think that settles the matter. The whole issue of the way of salvation could be settled. If people would take time to define one word, believe. What does it mean to believe? Sometimes to believe means just the exercise of mental assent. John 12, 42, 43, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many of them believed on Him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Him, lest they should be cast out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, they believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't even confess Him. It's true that an individual must exercise faith, but faith must exercise the individual before it avails. Now, belief is sometimes used in the Bible comprehensively, that is, to include other acts of obedience. 
According to Acts 18 and 8, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Shortly after the turn of the century, a group of men were gathered in an Alabama country store, and they were discussing what is involved in the plan of salvation. And one fellow pretty well rested his case on Acts 18 and 8. He said, the verse says that Crispus believed on the Lord with all of his house. It says further that many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. There is no indication that Crispus was ever baptized. As a matter of fact, I would give my horse and saddle to anyone who could prove that he was baptized. Well, a short time before he made that statement, a young preacher by the name of G.C. Brewer had walked into that store. He was not a participant in the discussion, but when the man issued that challenge, he could stay out no longer. So he opened his Bible to 1 Corinthians 1.14 and handed it to him. He said, Sir, would you read this verse? The man read where Paul wrote, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in mine own name. One of the fellows who had participated in the discussion said, It looks like you're going to have to give this boy your horse and saddle. Well, Brewer didn't want his possessions, but he did want him to see the truth. When Dr. Luke summed up the conversion of Christmas, he used one word. He believed. Paul gave one of the specifics at 1 Corinthians 1.14. He said he was baptized. What was baptism to Christmas? Belief. What is repentance? It's belief turning away from sin. What is confession? It's belief, saying aloud, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What is baptism? It is belief, obeying God, to be brought into a vital and a dynamic union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when the jailer was commanded to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and he would be saved, was he told simply to exercise mental or intellectual assent, or was he commanded to believe in the comprehensive sense which included other acts of obedience. And the only way in the world to answer that question is by continuing to read the conversion of the jailer. Verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Notice he heard the word of the Lord. According to Isaiah 2, written 750 years before Jesus came into the world, the word of the Lord was to go forth from Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2, you have an account of the word of the Lord, which eventually went forth from Jerusalem. If we can learn what was that word of the Lord predicted by Isaiah, and which went forth from Jerusalem, then we'll know what the jailer heard, because he heard the word of the Lord. Well, let's look to Acts 2, beginning at verse 22. Peter said, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, for it was not possible that he should be holden of it. In his concluding statement, according to Acts 2.36, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves, this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there added unto them about 3,000 souls. According to Acts 2, that was the word of the Lord, predicted by Isaiah, which went forth from Jerusalem. What is that word of the Lord? It's the sweet story of God's love as revealed in a crucified and a risen Lord and Savior. It's also the truth that if men want to be saved, they must repent and be baptized in Christ's name. And those who do such have two promises made to them. First is remission of sins, and the second is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And according to Acts 2.41, 3,000 people heard the word of the Lord, and they were baptized. The jailer heard that same word. How can you be sure? Read the next verse. He took them the same hour of the night, 
and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all of his, straightway. He took them somewhere. The Bible does not say where. I've had opportunity to travel in that part of the world where the events now being discussed took place. You can go to modern Kabbalah, ancient Neapolis, and travel from there about ten miles to the northwest, and you will find the ruins of second century Philippi. First century Philippi was destroyed by an earthquake, and another community was built in the same place. You can find the ruins only of second century Philippi. But Philippi and Neapolis were joined by a Roman road called the Ignatian Way. Say what you will about the Romans, they knew how to build roads. And there are large stretches of that road intact today, just as it was in the first century. And how I thrilled to walk over that road, because I knew my feet were touching some of the same stones which had been touched by Paul, Luke, Silas, Timothy, Secundus, Aristarchus, Sopater, and other good men who traveled in his missionary company. That road goes through Philippi, and out to the west it crosses a small river. Goes down to the south to Amphipolis, over to Apollonia, up to Thessalonica, and then further west to Berea. I think the jailer took those men out two miles west of the city to the small river to which I've just referred. It's my opinion that Lydia and the women mentioned in Acts 16, 13 to 15 were baptized at the very place where the road crossed the river. If you'll read that Acts 13, 16, 13 to 15 passage, You'll find that on the Sabbath day, Paul and Silas went out to a place where prayer was wont to be made. And they sat down and taught those women, and then they immersed them. Now, that was by the riverside. It makes sense to me to conclude that it happened right there where the Ignatian Way crossed that small river. And when I went there, I thrilled. And I thought, I'm at the very place where Lydia and those good ladies were baptized by Paul and Silas. And I'm probably at the very place where the jailer and his family were baptized early one morning. Now, I don't know all of that. That is, as far as the jailer is concerned, I'm totally convinced of the former, but not of the latter. I know he took them someplace, and he could very well have taken them to the place that I've just described. And when they arrived, the Bible says he washed their stripes. They'd been beaten with many stripes. Their backs were cut to pieces. And probably their garments were blood-soaked and may perhaps matted with their flesh. And the jailer lovingly, tenderly, and affectionately cleansed their wounds. He washed their stripes. Now, the Bible does not specifically say it, but it pretty clearly implies that in that action, he was expressing his penitent attitude. That is, he was sorry for the way he'd lived in the past. He is now submitting his will to the will of Almighty God. And Scripture continues by saying that and he and his household were baptized straightway or immediately. Now, let's see, when did they do that? Well, the Bible says it was the same hour of the night. Well, according to Acts 16, that earthquake occurred about midnight. And then after the earthquake, Paul and Silas preached to him. And, and you know, Paul was kind of like some other fellows I know. Once in a while, he was a bit long-winded. But... Uh, I wouldn't want to offend Jerry Jones, but uh, anyhow, he was a bit long-winded sometime. I don't know exactly how long they talked to him, but they preached. And the Bible says that he and his family were baptized the same hour of the night. What time was it when they were baptized? I don't know. One thirty, two o'clock in the morning? I don't know exactly, but it surely was an unusual time. I've told this story everywhere I've gone. And forgive me for being a repetition sinner, but I'm going to tell it again. I conducted my first meeting in a little country community north of here where I grew up. Now, that's old Grand Glaze, if you don't know where that is. Now, that's close to Possum Grape and Coffeeville and Oliphant. If you still haven't located, it's about 30 miles north. But I went back there to conduct a meeting. You say, why? Well, I guess because no one else would let me preach for them. And the brethren thought it would be all right for me to practice on them. So I went back there, and one night after service, I was engaged in some personal work. Well, really, I was with my girlfriend, but you wouldn't call that impersonal, would you? It's personal. All right. And my personal work kept me until about 11.30. Jumped into the car. I was in Newport. Started driving back south. 
came to the river bridge at Newport. There was a 26-year-old black man at the foot of that bridge hitchhiking. I picked him up. A gospel preacher in Chicago had already studied some with that young man. I picked him up, what, six, seven hundred miles south of Chicago? Was that an accident? Or was it an act of providence? Well, of course, I think it was the latter. To make a long story short, I studied with him until 3.30 in the morning and baptized him in Deep Party Creek near my home, and he went on his way rejoicing. My first convert was a hitchhiker. I've picked up many hitchhikers since. A hitchhiker can do one of two things. He can listen to the gospel or walk one or the other. <laughs> now, you have a captive audience, believe you me. I'll have to admit that I finally quit picking them up. I know of two Christian men who were killed by them, and so I finally decided that I had a greater obligation to my family than I did to hitchhikers, and so I quit picking them up. But my first convert was a hitchhiker. I baptized him at 3.30 in the morning. What an unusual hour. I was conducting a meeting for a black church in South Central Arkansas. One night, a 32-year-old man answered the invitation. He confessed his faith in Jesus, and the brethren there either did not have a baptistry, or if they had a baptistry, they didn't have any water in it. And if the latter's true, I guess that gives you some ideas to the confidence they had in me. But we had to find a place to baptize. So we drove about 18 miles to the south, and we found a church building where the brethren did have a little faith, about 18 inches of water. But that was enough to get the job done. There were some fine black ladies in attendance, and they said they thought the preaching was all right, but they wondered why in the world Jimmy was in such a hurry to baptize Burnus. And let me say this as an aside. Nine months later, Burnus was dead. He responded to the gospel invitation twice. I was present both times. The night he was baptized, the night he responded for restoration, and he was killed the next day. He was dead in 18 hours. I did his funeral. I'm convinced that he's with the Lord Jesus Christ. But now back to his initial conversion. The black ladies wondered why we were in such a hurry about baptizing him. Word got to me. I stood before the group the next night, and I said, Some of you are asking why we were in such a rush last night to baptize Bernice. My answer is for the same reason that Paul and Silas were in a rush to baptize the jailer. Why baptize him at such an unearthly hour? You see, Paul and Silas knew the importance of baptism. First time I saw this, it knocked the wind out of me. Baptism and salvation are joined six times in the New Testament. And in every one of those six references, baptism is first and salvation is second. And there's no exception to the rule. Mark 1, 4, baptism for remission of sins. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Luke 3, 3, baptism for remission of sins. Acts 22, 16, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 1 Peter 3.21, the like figure where unto even baptism doth also now save us. Six times in the Word of God when these two items are joined, it's number one, baptism, number two, salvation, no exception to the rule. It's always that way. Why? Because that's the truth. And if God had wanted to tell you and me that baptism precedes salvation, how else would He have told us other than the way He has already told us in those six references? Now, this is not a church Christ position. This is not a denominational stance. This is not a sectarian posture. This is a simple, clear import of the New Testament. You can study the New Testament from now until doomsday, and you will not find an unbaptized Christian. He or she is simply not there. Every Christian in the New Testament had been baptized prior to becoming a child of God. Now, Paul and Silas worked under the Great Commission. And in the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's why the jailer was baptized the same hour of the night. Those men knew their responsibility. Jesus said, Go teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They knew that they had an obligation to obey the Great Commission. And so when they taught people, they baptized them. 
The 3,000 on Pentecost heard one sermon, baptized. The Ethiopian heard the gospel one time, and he was baptized. Cornelius and his family heard the truth one time, and they were baptized. Lydia and the ladies to whom I referred earlier heard the message one time, and they were baptized. The message is preached. Baptism follows immediately. Why? That's God's scheme. That's the truth of the matter. Then verse 34 says, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. If I had a blackboard here tonight, at the top of the board I'd put Acts 16.31. And then I would write the word believe. At the bottom of the board I'd put Acts 16.34. And I'd write again the word believe. He was commanded to believe in Acts 16.31. He did believe according to Acts 16.34. What's in between the two verses? According to verse 33, you have the clear implication that he repented. And you have the specific statement that he was baptized. What kind of belief then was commanded to the jailer in verse 31? Just intellectual assent? Or was it that kind of belief that comprehended and included other acts of obedience? It's obvious from a study of the passage it was the latter kind, the kind which included his repentance and his baptism. Now, how was he converted? He was told about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He heard the story of the gospel. He heard the good news of salvation. He heard about God's love revealed in the agony of Jesus at Calvary. He heard of how the, the power of God, Jesus, was raised. He heard how he could receive Jesus as his Lord and his Savior. And he believed. And he repented. And he was baptized. And then he rejoiced. I want to ask you a question. I beg you to answer. I plead with you to answer, particularly if you're a visitor. Is your conversion like that one? The man heard the good news of Christ's death and resurrection. He put his trust and confidence in the Lord. He repented of his sins. He was baptized. And then he rejoiced. My conversion is exactly like that one in every respect. I studied the good news of the gospel for myself. I sat in a Bible class taught by Jack Sears. I believed in the Lord. I repented of my sins. I was baptized in the old Harding College swimming pool. And then I rejoiced. I praised God that He had saved my soul and made me one of His sons. My conversion is like that one. If your conversion is not like this one, remember, this one is right. Paul was on the scene. Paul was directed by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit so that he made no mistakes. He taught him infallibly and authoritatively and inerrantly the truth, simply the truth, just the truth. Nothing more than the truth, nothing less than the truth, nothing beside the truth. That man had it right. Jesus spoke of the apostles and said, When the Spirit comes, He'll guide you into all truth. Paul was there. Is your conversion like that? Next question. What denomination did the jailer and his family join? None. What? No, they didn't join any. There weren't any denominations in the first century. That was the time before sectarianism or denominationalism, as we know it, had arisen. You mean to tell me those people were saved and they were followers of the Lamb and they weren't in a church? No. They were in a church. Well, now... Well, how could they be in a church without being in a denomination? Well, in the first century, there was only one church. There was the one you read about in the Bible, but there were no denominations. There were no sects. Well, what church is that? It's the one Jesus had in mind when He said, Upon this rock I'll build my church. It's the one Luke had in mind when He said, The Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. It's the one Paul had in mind when He said that God gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. Well, what's it called? Well, it's, it's called the church of God. The church of the firstborn. Church of saints. A church of Christ. Most of the time it's simply referred to as the church. There are many expressions you could use in reference to it. You could call it the first century church. The apostolic church. The universal church. The rock-founded church. The spirit-filled church. The Hadean-proof church. The blood-bought church, the godly church, the Christly church, the saintly church. There are many different expressions that can be used to identify it. As people think of church names today, it didn't have one. 
You mean he was simply in the Lord's church and not a part of any sect? That's right. He was an undenominational, non-sectarian, New Testament Christian. Well, what name religiously did he wear as an individual? He could have been called a saint, a disciple, a believer, a brother, a friend. The nearest thing to a religious name for an individual in the New Testament is the word Christian. At 1 Peter 4, 16, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name, according to some translations. So he was a child of God. He was redeemed by the blood of Christ. He was born again of the water and the Spirit. He was added to the church you read about in the Bible. He lived and died as a follower of Jesus, and he never did join a sect, and he never did join a denomination. Let me ask you something. Do you believe a hundred people today could be religiously what he was then? Do you believe a hundred people could experience the new birth, could constitute a congregation, could meet together on stated occasions for worship, never join a sect, live and die as undenominational Christians, and go to heaven? If you believe the New Testament, you'll have to say yes. If a hundred could a thousand, yes. If a thousand could a million, yes. If a million could ten million, yes. If ten million could all of those who profess faith in Jesus do it, yes. If it can't be done, why not? They did it in the first century. Can't we be today non-sectarian, undenominational, born-again, New Testament Christians, a part of the church you read about in the Bible, that and no more? There's a lot of talk today about ecumenism. A lot of talk about unity. Why doesn't someone stand up and say, hey, let's get beyond Protestantism. Let's get all the way back beyond Catholicism. Let's get beyond the apostasy. Let's go back to the first century. Let's get to the waters that bubbles forth from the ground and its freshness and its purity. And let's strive to be in the 20th century just what those people were then. The people who meet here regularly are striving to be what I've just described. They are attempting to be undenominational New Testament Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing beside. One might say in response to that claim, yes, I've heard the wind blow before. Well, maybe we're wrong. But if the people who meet here regularly are wrong in their claim, they're no wrong than anyone else in the community. But on the other hand, if they're right, they occupy the ground of the apostles. If everything else is right, this is right. If everything else is wrong, this plea is still right. And I'm going to live and die simply as a child of God and a part of the church you read about in the Bible without being affiliated with any sect or denomination. And if you take away from me the plea to restore undenominational Christianity, I will go into infidelity. There is no stopping point between the idea of restoring the early church and atheism. Not logically. It's either strive with all of my heart to be what they were or just give up the whole ball of wax. Anyone who has studied his New Testament knows that Catholicism is not the religion of the New Testament. Protestantism is not the religion of the New Testament. The only thing that makes sense to someone who wants to follow the New Testament is the idea of getting back to what people were in the first century and being precisely what they were religiously, not culturally, religiously. I want to be what the jailer was. Another question. How long did take the jailer to pray through? There's no indication that he prayed through. What about his relating of a Christian experience? There's no indication that such was done. How long did it take Paul and Silas to get the jailer and his family baptized in the Holy Spirit? There isn't any indication that, that it, uh, there was even an attempt at such. Uh, how was he baptized? 
Well, Ephesians 4 or 5 says it's one baptism. And Colossians 2.12 says we're buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with Him through faith, the operation of God is raised Him from the dead. Now, there's just one. Scripture says we're buried and we're raised. That looks strongly like immersion. There are a number of people in this audience tonight who have studied Greek. And they know the Greek verb baptizo means to immerse or to submerge or to dip. Metaphorically, it means to overwhelm. I mentioned earlier that I've traveled in the Middle East and I've seen the ruins of ancient church buildings. You know, the early church didn't put up buildings because of persecution. They weren't allowed to erect them. And except for one spot, I think the church buildings will go back to the 5th century. Now, there's one place that you can find one earlier. And I have seen the ruins of some of those 5th century church buildings. As a matter of fact, there's one at Philippi. And I've been through it. And as I was going through it, I had a guidebook in front of me, trying to find various things, and I began to look for the baptistry. You might ask, well, where was the guide? I didn't have one. Well, why didn't you? They cost money. Guides learn just like the rest of us do. They read the books written by the archaeologists and the scholars. And a guide can be of help to you sometimes only in one way. He's been there before and he can find it quicker than you can, but guides in most instances are very unreliable. So I just decided I was going to study the books myself. And most of the places we'd go, we had the books before us and we'd studied ahead of time, and thus I was trying to find a baptistry. Now, I don't know whether I found it, but if I did, there isn't any doubt about the kind they used in that church building, just like this one behind me. As a matter of fact, it was in the same location, apparently behind the speaker's stand and a tank. I've been to other church buildings. The baptist was not behind the speaker. was out in the middle of the floor. Always a pool. You go to Ephesus, it's not only a pool, but it's a pool in the shape of a cross. There's no doubt about it from an archaeological point of view. The early church emerged. You can prove it in English, you can prove it in Greek, and you can flat prove it by the archaeological evidence. The early church immersed. The jailer was immersed. He was submerged. Another question. How about your family? Is your family united in Jesus like the jailers? The Bible says he believed on the Lord with all his house. I want to talk to, to us men for a minute, fellas. The Lord intends that we be the head of our families, not only in an economic sense, but also in a spiritual sense. I've made a lot of mistakes in life. If Marilyn's here, I'm surprised she hasn't said amen. But I uh, made a lot of mistakes. But let me tell you one I haven't made. I haven't said to her, all right, now, girl. It's your responsibility to teach them the Word of God. It's your responsibility to take them to church. It's your responsibility to pray with them. Don't ever ask me to engage in any of those activities. I'm going to take care of the food, the shelter, and the clothing, and that's it now. Not anything more out of me. And you know, if that had been my attitude toward my wife and family, I believe I'd find me a hole someplace and crawl into it. And I think I'd pull that hole in after me, and I'd stay there. Or else I'd take my stand as a man and try to help my family go to heaven. Listen, charity begins at home. I want everybody in this room to go to heaven. I mean everybody. I don't want anyone here to be lost. But I surely want Cindy and Jimmy and Mike and Jeff and Marilyn to go to heaven. Those are, that, that's my bunch. I really want them to go. Fellas, do you know the word that the sociologists are using today to describe American society? The word is matriarchy. Over and over again, matriarchal society. You know what that means? It means that children are growing up in homes where there are no men. I know about that. I grew up in one. A lot of you grew up in them, too. I know in many instances when families split, the woman is at fault. She walk off and leave a man with two or three children, but I am convinced in most instances it's not the woman, it's the man who is at fault. And so there's a woman, two, three, four children. She's left to sink or swim by herself. Some men seem to think that the only responsibility they have as husband and father is the obligation involved in sexual activities by which children are brought into the world. Even an animal can do that. 
God intends that the man be the head of the family spiritually. How about it, fellas? Are we trying to be what we ought to be in front of our youngsters? Are we trying to be good Christian men? How about it, ladies? Are you striving to be before your youngsters what the Lord wants you to be? How about it, teenagers? If your mom and dad really knew what kind of life you're living, they'd be happy? Huh? Are there young people in this audience tonight, as far as family are concerned, who are on the outside looking in? Are there older people in the audience tonight, as far as family are concerned, on the outside looking in? Your family's not united in Jesus? Now, we think our children are the most precious things in the world, and they are, but they're going to grow up, and they're going to stand before God one day and give an account of the deeds done to the body, and we're determining their destiny right now. There are a lot of young people in this audience, I beg you to hear me. You're going to get married. You're going to have offspring. What are you going to do for them? The Lord puts the responsibility upon the mother and the father primarily to see to it that they're brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. How are yours going to turn out? It's not enough to criticize your own mother and daddy and say they fail me. What are you going to do better? We're losing the battle all over the United States. You know we're losing the battle. And we're losing it primarily at home. That's where it's being lost. The jailer, the whole family, turned to the Lord at the same time. Where are the devoted, God-fearing, dedicated, pure Christian men today? Where are they? You say this building's filled with them. That's right. You go to the average church and take a look, and the women outnumber the men by two to one. You just look. You say you don't know. Well, I'm an authority on looking at different congregations. I've looked at them all over the United States, and most of the time the women will outnumber the men two to one. What in the world has happened to our men? What's happened to them? Whether you are a part of a family unit or not, if you're all by yourself, you have an obligation to the Lord and to yourself to be a Christian. But if you are a part of a family, then you have an added responsibility and obligation to serve the Lord for their benefit. If I get to heaven, I have sense enough to know that Marilyn will have made a great contribution toward my eternal salvation. And if I get to glory, I'll have sense enough to know that my children have made a contribution to my salvation. We are dependent upon one another in the family. The Lord wants families united. Now, it's bad to have a divided family. There's one thing worse, and that's when the whole family is united in sin and not a member has any hope of going to heaven. Boy, it's wonderful to be a part of a Christian family. Now, why in the world should I blush to talk to one of my children about Jesus? Or why should I be embarrassed to pray with them? Or why should I be embarrassed to just have a, a, a good old knock-down, drag-out biblical argument with one of them? What's wrong with that? Well, to me, it's just part and parcel of life. That's the way the Lord intended it. But I think there's some men who are ashamed or who are embarrassed. Men, women, boys, and girls. Let's not sing, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. Is there a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky? Let's not sing that song about being united in heaven unless we intend to be united in Christ here on earth. It starts here, and it continues into the next life. Finally, how many sermons did that man hear before he changed? You know the answer. One. Just one.